is being uh, this letter is to Timothy from Paul, and Paul saying, Timothy, you should know this. So church, we're about to read something that we should already know, and it should already be evident to us, but it's not just about stopping like we said at the beginning, it's about starting as well. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. We're living in such an hour that the police department gets calls during the school year. We get pe- parents call the police during the school year saying, can you come to our house? My kid won't get out of bed. Whew. There was never any need for my grandmother, Reedy Tibbs, to call the police on Edward or Bobby or Jimmy or Mary Alice to get out of bed. There was no effort ever made by my mother to get Damien or Deshaun or Belinda or Bianca out of bed because, and it seems to me that the further the country gets away from God, the further the parents, their discipline becomes weaker and weaker and weaker towards their children. Do you hear what I'm saying? They took the Bibles out of schools and the guns came in. They took the prayer out of school and the drugs came in. The more a society distances itself from God, the more Satan takes its place. Okay? Let's keep going. This, okay, um, I'm sorry. They will only love themselves. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. So listen, don't hold on to any of these things. As you hear this being said, let's make sure that none of this is found in us. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. This is talking about the last days. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. That last one has really affected the church. And I'm talking about all of us because I'm just as guilty. They love pleasure more than God. What's an example? I can watch three hours of television, but I can't pray for 30 minutes. What does that mean? That I love pleasure more than God. So wherever your heart is, your actions will follow. So it's not about about the uh, ritual of reading the word or praying. It's not about religious rituals. It's about what you love. It's about who you love. When we love ourselves, we will do what pleases us. When we love God, we will do what pleases God. I'll say that again. Every morning, we should wake up and say, who do you love? Look in the mirror and say, who do you love? Who are you going to love today? You're going to love you? You're going to do everything you want? Or you're going to love God? And the way that we eliminate our competition The way that we eliminate that craving for the things of this world, the Bible says that all that is in this world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How do we get rid of it? The cross. Pick up your crosses, deny yourselves daily, and follow me. So here's what's going on. And I'm speaking to the church Because it's us who are being called to live a radical life. You see, this is where we've gotten, but we're not staying there. It used to be, it used to be that the world or sinners knew the difference between us and them. It used to be that there were certain things that we wouldn't do that they do. 
But now it seems more and more that church people, the people that belong to God, do every single thing that the world does. And there's no difference. There's no radical difference between us and them. And then came that, uh, what word am I looking for, God? Oh, Jesus. Tainted grace. That grace that was being preached that said, oh, God is just so loving and forgiving. You can do whatever you want. And he just, oh, he'll just forgive you. He doesn't mind. His grace is just abundant towards you. A distortion of grace. Yes, God is graceful, but we are not to abuse his grace. There is still supposed to be a difference between who we are and who the world is. But it seems this way. Everything the world listens to, we listen to. Everything the world watches, we watch. You see, when I was growing up, if we had something crazy on the television, my parents would say, turn that mess off. Get that out of here. And I catch myself doing it to my children as well. But here's the demonic agenda. It used to be that when, your ch- when children watched TV and, and demons tried to entertain them, it was right in the living room. But now we have gadgets and devices where our children can go in their bedrooms for hours and we don't know what is being presented to them. That's why, parents, it's time to be mean again. It's time to be nosy again. It's time to be in their business again and say, what are you watching and what are you listening to and what are you doing? Because the devil will come through any open door that he can get into. And he's just like a bat or a mouse. He only needs enough room for his head to get his body through. Church, I'm not trying to preach at you in a way that would make it seem as if I was trying to be um, lawful. I'm not trying to preach law on you, okay? But what I am trying to preach towards you is repentance. That if it was an evil work and if it was dirty and nasty before you got saved, it's still evil, dirty, and nasty after you got saved. There must be a radical difference, okay? And here's what, see, see, here's what religion does. Here's what religion does. Here's how we can tell how religious we are. Here we go. So, if Jesus came back to the earth and, and nobody else could see him but you, And he says, this week, I'm going to be with you everywhere you go. Every single where you go, I'm going to be with you. So if you're in the living room, I'm there. You're in the car, I'm there. So whatever you do and whatever you say, here I am. And you can see Jesus the whole time. Here's the the drastic difference between relationship and religion. If your life would change totally and drastically just because Jesus was physically with you this week than it was last week, then it means you're just religious. A relationship with Jesus means this. My life is wide open before you always. I'm always living to please you. I want all of my words and all of my actions to be pleasing in your sight. So it's not just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act righteous just because you're with me. Listen. The truth is that it's, it's an even greater revelation than Jesus being physically with you every day. He actually lives in you. So if I'm going to sit and watch a movie with 87 cuss words in it, then what I am doing is I am subjecting the Spirit of God to all of this cussing and nudity and violence as if he was sitting beside me. It is greater than if he's sitting beside us because he is sitting in us. And not only is he sitting in us, the word of God says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. So the same thing you watch in your bedroom is on display in heavenly places. Does that change your life? We're aiming to be more radical. If Jesus was with you everywhere you went, you'd probably have to stop gossiping, wouldn't you? Probably have to stop judging people, wouldn't we? Probably have to stop looking too long at women or men when they walk by, wouldn't we? If Jesus was with us, but he is in us. 
And the way he wants to live in us is unrestricted. He doesn't want the competition of the flesh always being there. He doesn't want to have to keep saying, no, look this way. No, look this way. No, don't say that. No, don't do that. He doesn't want to have to spend the whole day doing that. He wants to live in you so that you can obey him. So the first step in the radical life is a radical death. To say, I give up my life, Jesus, so that you can live here. Jesus, see, we are called the body of Christ because we are where he lives. I'm going to give you time to write that down. We are called the body of Christ Because we are where his spirit lives. Never forget that. Amen? Amen. All right. So, there should be a difference. There used to be a difference in the way we dressed. There used to be a difference in our music. There used to be a difference in what we watched and what we did. I wish I could find that word I'm looking for. But, um... There's a standard of righteousness, and what's the standard of righteousness? The standard of righteousness is not what you think is good and what you think is bad. The standard of righteousness is that the Holy Spirit lives in you, and all that is good or is evil is already known because you have the mind of Christ. So let's put something on right now. Everyone, can can, can I see your hands? Hands up. All right. All right. Hand, now, now, hold your hands out like this. Say this with me. This is, this is the, mind of the mind of Christ. This is, this is a, gift a gift from God. I reject, I reject the knowledge of, knowledge of good, and evil, good and evil. And I put on, put it on, I put on, I put on the mind of Christ. In order to do what he did, I must think as he thought. In order to see what he saw, I must believe as he did. I reject my carnal mind. I reject my sinful mind. I reject my lust and I put on his love. I have, I I possess, I I choose to use use the mind of Christ. Christ. For I am am a son son or a daughter daughter of the Most High God. God. And those that belong to God God are led by His Spirit. Spirit. I am led by His Spirit because I have the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. That is what eliminates the double mind. The double mind is the source of every Christian's problem. The double mind. The double mind makes us unstable in all of our ways. So there is a call from God that we need to begin to, oh my goodness, We need to begin to separate ourselves from this world. Do you know why? Because the world is about to be destroyed and all who love the world and the things of the world don't belong to God. So it's time to begin to drop things. As Pastor Jim just preached a couple weeks ago, the things that we had in the wilderness we can't take with us into the promised land. The things that you held on to in your sinful life can't go with you into your righteous life. If you had a a, a wife and a girlfriend when you were unsaved, you got to choose one and hate the other now. If you had two masters before, you got to choose one and hate the other now. Why? Time is running out. God is coming back to separate the sheep from the goats. And listen to me. It's already began. The sheep are walking this way, and the goats are walking this way. The sheep are saying this, and the goats are saying that. And then we got those poor little confused beings in the middle. Let that not be us. 
half sheep, half goats. What are they called? Shoats. <laughs> Let me tell you the old school way that I used to hear it. Either you're a saint or you're an ain't. That's it. There is no, there is no mixed breed. You're either a sheep or a goat, a saint or an ain't. And time is running out, and you better choose sides, okay? So listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, this might be where I close right now, okay, is, is a call to separate ourselves. Listen to me. Listen, listen good on this one. If the Republican Party begins to believe and push platforms and agendas that are ungodly, you need to separate yourself. If the Democratic Party begins to push uh, ungodly agendas and things that separate them from God, you need to separate yourself. So you don't walk around saying, I am a this or I am a that. If it's not, I am a child of God. That's the first thing you need to be. That's what you need to focus on the most is being a child of God. Because the Bible didn't say, I'm coming back for, for, um, for, uh, for, for Republicans without spot or wrinkle. He didn't say, I'm coming back for Democrats without spot or wrinkle. He said he's coming back for a bride, his church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So the call is to separate ourselves. When God was upset with the children of Israel, he said, Moses, move out of the way. I'm about to open up the ground and I'm going to swallow all of them. Separate yourself. When God came as an angel of death uh, during the Passover, he told them, I want you to separate yourselves by, by painting blood on the doorpost. Separate yourselves. And all who did it that night, their houses were spared and no one died in those houses because they separated themselves. I know that there is a demonic agenda in this world to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but if you separate yourself, it will not touch your house and it will not touch your family because the blood of Jesus Christ has separated us from this world. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is the perfect Lamb of God and He knows those who belong to him and his sheep know his voice and a stranger they will not follow. There's a lot of voices out there right now. And there's going to be a lot of false prophets rising up saying Jesus is over here and Jesus is over there. But the word of God says that his sheep know his voice. It's time to separate ourselves. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Don't team up with those who were unbelievers. Okay? How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live in darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? As it, as it relates to relationships, single women, listen to me. Single men, listen to me. If you belong to God, don't go after a woman or a man who does not. They are not your Bible project. They are not your Christian homework. They are either saved or they are not. Now, listen, I gotta, can I just preach some biblical truth? Man. So listen, if two unbelievers get married, okay, and then one of them comes to Christ, then through the power of the Holy Spirit, let's just say it's the wife, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that husband becomes a holy assignment. That's an assignment for you. And the Bible says that her righteous living before him can win his soul to the Lord. But the Bible says nothing about, nothing about righteous single people going after unrighteous single people and there being a transformation that occurs that doesn't happen. And I don't even care if you don't clap or stomp or smile. 
You know, I used to get to the point where it, when I first started preaching that if you didn't have a response, it kind of, oh man, like that didn't go over so well. But now I don't even care because I'm giving you the truth. And I've learned this. I've learned this. The more quiet they are, the truer it is. Now you'll be loud. We don't team up with unbelievers. Even if you got a business. Don't go into business as a business partner with an unbeliever because you'll be unequally yoked. You've got to partner up with righteousness. You've got to partner up with light. So you can be an example before them. When I say separate yourselves, I'm not saying let's all move. Let's buy some land and move to a compound and get some cows and we'll raise our own food. It might come to that, but not today. I'm saying... Let your life be separate from their life. I'm not, because what happens is this. What happens is this. Ah, oh, man. But come here. I was going to use a woman, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling more comfortable doing it this way. So, if I'm a woman, and I'm an unbeliever, and he's a righteous man, and he begins to fall for me, Okay, you see, the Bible says that sinners hate light, okay, because it causes them to see their sin and they just want to remove themselves from it. But it, so if he loves me so much that he doesn't want his light to be offensive to me because he wants to spend time with me, he loves me, he wants to take me for milkshakes and the movies and all that. He doesn't. He doesn't want me to. He doesn't want me to see him as offensive. But if he's always talking about Jesus, that's offensive to me. If he's always saying, "Come on, let's go to church, let's pray," that's offensive to me. And what I'm saying to him is, I don't want to spend that much time with you because you just keep talking about Jesus. If he loves me enough, what he's gonna start doing is talking less and less and less about Jesus. And if his life was on fire for God, what's going to happen so that he could win me? See, gasoline's not going to be poured on me so I can catch on fire for God. But water is going to be poured on him so his fire can go out so that we can be more equally yoked. Do we understand? That's why we don't try to enter into relationships with unbelievers because it's going to affect your Christian life. It's going to affect your walk. You are going to lose power. The enemy is going to gain power. And before you know it, he will be living as a sinful man and not her living as a righteous woman. Amen? Amen. All right. You may be seated. That was a bonus right there. That wasn't something that I was in the message. All right, let's keep going. And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Say this with me. I am, I am the, temple the temple of the living God. As God said. Here's what God said. This is God's testimony. I will live in them. Where? In us. And walk among them. Remember we said, would our lives change if Jesus came back uh, and presented himself to us and we could see him? What he's saying here is this. Listen, I am going to live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the things that I wanted you to know was this. The closer you move to the darkness, the more you'll have to dim your light to fit in. The children of Israel were separated and called out to live radical lives with a radical faith in God that he would provide for them in the wilderness. But after the joy from their deliverance wore off, they began craving Egypt again. So the next time I talk to you, that's where we will pick it up. And that's the, that's the danger of letting your light dim. 
That's the danger of the double mind. That's the danger of not picking up your cross and denying yourself. Because if you don't deny yourself, what happens is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, the pride of life comes back upon you and you begin to reach for those things in the world that you were supposed to have left behind because you're no longer saying no to yourself. You begin to say no to God and you begin to long after the things of the world just as Egypt began to, I'm sorry, Israel began to long after Egypt again. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Father, I thank you for the word you've given us today. You've given it in truth and you've given it in power. But now, God, I have to dismiss them. I have to allow them to leave and be under your care. I was able to speak a word from heaven this morning to them. And for the most part, they were in agreement with it. But now the time has come where they get to leave and lead the lives that they want to again. But time is running out. And a world that is radically in sin needs a people who will rise up radically in righteousness. It's time that the people we work with know that we are saved. It's time that our neighbors know that we are saved. Because the Bible says that if we hide our lives or our light from them, we are only hiding from them who are lost. Those who don't know you as their Savior. Holy Spirit, you are the one who enters our lives to make us radical. And the definition of radical is drastically different from the original. We should be living lives that are drastically different from the life of sin that we used to live. And the power to live this radical life comes from the same power that Jesus received when he was baptized by John in the river of Jordan. They saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus as a dove. And after that, he began to do wondrous things and preach the kingdom of God and say, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord, the cares of this world from Sunday to next Sunday, the cares of this world do very much to choke out the worry that we receive today. The cares of this world try so hard to reveal the seed that should have been planted in our hearts. We will just lay them on the table and they will not grow in us. So God, I thank you that the words that you gave me to speak today were not just words, but they lead to power. May every believer that heard these words today realize that they have been given power in the form of faith. Man, that's good. We just receive, by the hearing of the word of God, power in the form of faith. So then how then will we release the power? Through faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. May we live faith-filled lives as we leave this place today. In the name of Jesus Christ. May your anointing be upon us all. May we walk in love, identity, faith, and eternal purpose that leads us to walk and live a life of rest, revelation, empowerment, strategy, and triumph. God, may our differences be radical this week. May our prayer time be radical this week. May the time that we read your word be radical this week. Or else we run the risk of just being regular, regular again for a whole nother week. Just regular church-going humans. Not those that are living under the power and influence of God, but just simply humans that go to church. That's not what we are. We are divine beings. We have been remade in the power and the image of God. So Lord, just create an appetite within us all for prayer and for worship and for service. Lord, we pray a blessing over our outreach this Wednesday, God, as Compel Ministry goes out, God. 
I pray that you would change our minds about compel. That that's just not something that they do, but something that we do as the church of Jesus Christ. Help us to pick up our cross and deny ourselves and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, you have an opportunity to.